So let's dive right into the word. Um, let's turn to um, First Timothy, First Timothy chapter six, and I have the slides um, here. Yeah, First Timothy chapter six. This is what I'm going to share. Um, godliness with contentment is great gain. Can you read this together on the count of three? One, two, three. Godliness. Okay, good. One more time. One, two, three. Okay, so that is in the First Timothy chapter six, verse six. Yeah, verse six to um, eight. Let me read. Then I'll explain the context of this passage. Um, now, godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with this we shall be content. Amen. Amen. It is. I think it is easy for us, um, the ordinary people, to to understand and read this passage. But if it is for rich people to read this, I think it is it will be very difficult. Yeah. So let me give you um, the the context behind this passage. Embedded in this uh, message that I want to share is my, is my passion for Jesus. And I want to bring this out so that we can have the same passion for Jesus. Amen? Amen. That you would love Jesus. That you would be so desperate for Jesus. That every day, every morning that you wake up, that the first person that you want to meet is Jesus. Amen. That's it. Not the handphone or the WhatsApp. But the first person you want to see, the first thing that you want to read is the Word of God. Amen or not? Amen. Yeah? How many of you, you love Jesus? Amen. Yes, that's very good. I asked the same question yesterday. I'm not yesterday, last week. Yeah? So how many of you, you read the Bible every day? Yes. <laughs> it's very easy to, to test and see whether we really love Jesus or not. Now, the, another question I want to ask, how many of you Memorize scriptures and when is the last time you memorize scripture? When was the last time? Last month. How about last week? How about this week? Or was it just a few months ago? So how much does the word mean to you? Is the word treasure to you? First Timothy was written by Paul, and you know that Paul was uh, in prison many times, many times, and he wrote a few letters uh, in prison. But first and second Timothy were his last letters before he passed on, were his last letters to Timothy. And so these letters were very, like very intimate. You, you hear words like, I'm going to depart. I'm going to go away, and I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. You know, words like this, that means words of like a dying person, and therefore it's very important. And he also says something very important, that the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So Timothy, I have taught you this, now I'm going, now I'm passing the baton to you, now you continue, you carry on. And then there's here, so here in verse 5, verse 5, um, Paul says this. Is, is the, word, the verse is a bit hanging, but I just read it through. Useless wranglings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Paul says, who support these people, that means he was addressing them some false teachings or false teachers who use godliness as a means of personal gain. That means they are using religion uh, to profit something, get something, get something out of religion just for themselves. Uh, which is very true today, because today there is a distorted view about Christianity. Um, where we normally hear, especially in religious uh, television, by all these um, gospel of blessings teachers, that says that, you know, when you receive Jesus into your life, 
and God will materially bless you in health and wealth. How many of you heard like messages like this before? You know, I have seen a, a YouTube. It was shown to me uh, in a YouTube of a very charismatic speaker. You know, charismatic speaker, and he, and he speak about blessings of wealth and ask and challenge the people. You give to the kingdom of God. When you give, God will bless you in abundance. You just give, and so he challenged the people to give, and the people really uh, literally run to the pulpit and throw the money. You know, throw the money. Have you, have you seen this? I don't know whether you see this YouTube. You throw the money. I say, woo! And I throw the money expecting that God will bless them materially. Because they say this, if as a Christian, you are not blessed materially and, and in health, then something is wrong with you. <laughs> if you are not blessed, you are not materially healthy and wealthy, something is wrong with your faith. And Paul is addressing this. Paul is telling us this is not what Christianity is about. Yes, the gospel will bring blessing. Yes, it will bring blessing, but not the kind of blessing that the false teachers is telling us. So what is that blessing that is in the gospel? And so Paul says this in verse 6, Godliness with contentment, that is great gain. That is great gain. So we want to take time uh, to look at each of the word. Okay, how do we define the word? The first one is godliness. Now what is godliness? Um, I simplified it by this word, godlikeness. So godliness is the desire to become like God, like Jesus. Because that's the ultimate purpose why we were created, to become like Jesus, to become like Him. We were created in the image of God and to become like Him, to become like God. So if you like it, you can, you can uh, easily remember godliness is to become like God, God-likeness, to become like Jesus. It's about personal relationship. Yeah, growing Christ-likeness, abiding relationship. It's not about religion or ritual, following ritual, coming to church. Sunday after Sunday is like ritual. It's, it's not about religion. In fact, God hates religion. God hates religion. Do you agree? God hates religion. In fact, it is the religious teachers that kill Jesus. It is the religious teachers, the religious people that kill Jesus. And therefore, God hates religion. It's not religion, but it is a, an abiding relationship. Personal relationship. More of abiding. Abiding, living in Him and He in us. So that is godliness. Godliness, conformity to God. Godliness with contentment. What is contentment? The next one. Contentment is not about getting everything you want. Yeah? Especially in a society like this, there's so many things. We want this, we want that. New handphone come out, we want that also. Yeah. So, and then we get contented when we get something new. But biblical contentment is not in the things of the world. So contentment is not having all you want, but wanting only what you have. It is satisfied with what you have. What God has blessed us. And we can be grateful. Yes. A good example of that contentment is in Paul itself. Uh, he wrote a verse in Philippians. Okay, next one. And he says this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. I have learned in whatsoever, whatsoever state I am, therein to be content. That means whatsoever state that you are in, we actually can be contented without wanting more. Yeah? I have learned both to be a base to live without anything. I have learned to abound, to have all I need. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and want. Then he wrote this very uh, familiar verse to us, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Wow, this is the spirit of contentment. To be contented wherever that you are without having the need wanting for more. 
godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, next one. What do we gain? What is our gain that can make us very contented and very satisfied and be grateful to the Lord? You know, in Christ we gain the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? We gain the Father. We gain the Father who is our Good Shepherd, like what Psalms 23 says, right? The Good Shepherd, the Lord is our Shepherd. The Lord is my Shepherd, I shall not be in want. Wow, I shall not be in want. That means God will provide. Um, he is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yeah? I look up to the hill and the mountains. Where does my help come from? Yeah, and He is my present help, my very present help in times of need. And He will never leave us and will never forsake us. This is our good Father. This is our good Father and with Him we can be contented. With the Father, you just seek the Father's face every day, you can be contented. And then we gain the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son. What can you tell about the Son? If people ask you about the Son, what can you tell about the Son, Jesus Christ? Actually, there's so many, but I want to look at just uh, in the Gospel of John. You know, in the Gospel of John, you have the seven I am sayings of Jesus. Yes. How many of you have heard about the seven I am sayings of Jesus? Yeah? It's only found in the Gospel of John. The seven I am sayings of Jesus. Can you give some examples? Ah, okay, some of you know. Okay, now, why is it so important that I am saying? Actually, the I am saying, I am, when Jesus says I am, He is showing that He is divine. Yes. Divine, the same as the Father. Because in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, um, when God uh, appeared to Moses at a burning bush, He used that name, I am. I am who I am. And Jesus, in the Gospel of John, used the same name, I am. And the first I am that he says he mentioned in the Gospel of John was John chapter 6, verse 35, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Wow, when you have Jesus, you shall never hunger, you shall never thirst. Always be satisfied. That means God provides. And then the second I am saying is John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. He who comes to me shall never walk in darkness and will have the light of life. Wow, do you have life? Yes. Only some. <laughs> People are looking for life, you know, outside. And this life is found in Jesus. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall never, never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen. Wow. Amen. And then the third I am saying, Jesus is um, John 10. John chapter 10 is a very familiar verse where Jesus introduced himself as the good shepherd. And so in John chapter 10 verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. I am the door. If anyone enters by me shall be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Oh, fine pasture. The Lord will always guide us into green pasture. Yes. Yes. And John chapter 10, verse 11, the same chapter, Jesus also says that I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. The good shepherd gives his life, lay down his life for the sheep. And then the next one is John 11. John 11, 25. Uh, when, when Jesus says this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I find this verse very interesting because it says, He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Yes. You were thinking, he died and then he lived. He died and then he lived. So, how does that reconcile? Though he may die, he shall live. Whoever believes in me shall never die. That means we as believers, we shall never face the second death. 
You know the second death is mentioned in the book of Revelation, the second death. We will never face the second death. As believers, we have two births, one day. We are born in the flesh and we are born in the spirit, but we will only die once. We will only die once and there will be no second death. That means the salvation is secure. And not only that, you know, Jesus also not just give us and assure our salvation, but Jesus also protect our salvation. That means protect us. Because in the same Gospel of John, in John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus says this, My sheep hears my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Wow. You just meditate on them, and it will just give you so much faith. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That means God or Jesus does not just promise us the salvation, but God also makes sure that we are truly saved. He protects our salvation. He, he will make sure that we reach our destination. And then the next I am saying when Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father yes and then the final one that I am saying is John chapter 15 verse 1 and 2 how many of you know John chapter 15 John chapter 15 is a very familiar chapter there's a song to it as well when Jesus says that uh, I am the what yes if you say I am the wine you're wrong must be I am the true wine because in Isaiah, God also says that the, the, the Israelites are the wine, but they were unfaithful. So when it comes to the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the true wine. I am the true wine, and my father is the wine dresser. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, he will take away, but any branch that bears fruit, he shall prune, that it will become more fruitful. Wow. You see, when you have Jesus, you have everything. And that is true contentment. Jesus, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. And then we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. Where is the Holy Spirit now? Yes, it is in us. And this is what Jesus also promised in John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. You know, um, the context of that verse when Jesus says that, I'm, I'm going to leave, but I'm not going to leave you often. I'm going to send the helper, and the helper will be in you and will be with you, yes. abiding in you. And the Holy Spirit is our helper. In, in fact, Jesus himself depended a lot on the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus says this, The Spirit of the Lord was upon me and has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The same thing that happened to Jesus in the ministry will also happen to us because of the Holy Spirit that is abiding in us right now. Amen? Amen. That means what Jesus has done, we can also do. Yes. In fact, even greater than that. Yes. Do you agree? Yes. You must go, what? Greater than what Jesus has done? Yes, because that's what Jesus said. Yes. Yes. Jesus says in John chapter 14, yes. verse 12, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than he will do, because I go to the Father. Yes. Wow, why, why, how is it that we can do all these things? Because now we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Yes. Wow, you see, when you are in Christ, you have the Father, you have the Son, you have the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. What else you want? <laughs> so, from the beginning, Paul is telling us, True godliness, true gain, true gain is found in godliness. To become like Jesus, to pursue Christ. So the first thing that this passage is telling us, our contentment is not found in the things of the world. Jesus says this, 
The next one, please. Our next one. Jesus said that a person's life does not consist of the abundance of things which he possesses. Amen? Yeah. One more time. A person's life does not consist of the abundance of things which he possesses. I want to uh, say something. Uh, 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 I, uh, for me, it's a very strong statement, personally. Our soul was not created to find contentment in the things of the world. Yes. I want to repeat that because it, it came very strong to me. Our soul, that means we were not created to find contentment in the things of the world. The things of the world are the carrots that Satan dangles in front of us. That tries to distract us from what is the reality of contentment and gain. To distract us from the reality of what is the truth. How many of you get distracted very easily? Now that you learn about this, <laughs> we get so easily distracted by the things of the world that distract us from the truth. We need to really focus on the word and fill ourselves with the word of God. We get so easily distracted, especially right now this season. Especially in an affluent society like Hong Kong. Yeah. yeah? Because no persecution, very comfortable. Yeah. So we, we feel very complacent. Yeah. So easy to come to church, you know. Yeah. Wait till, wait till you, you get persecuted. <laughs> but of course, we do not want to wait for that, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. John says this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Do not love the world. Yeah. All the things in the world. Because if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Yeah. Because all the things in the world, the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world is passing away, yeah. and the last of it, but he who does the will of God, abides forever. Amen. Do not love the world. Yeah? And Paul proved the point with this next verse uh, in verse 7. He says this, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain, see he emphasized, it is certain we can carry nothing out. Amen. It's so clear. See, things don't make us happy. We bring nothing into the world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. When you were born into the world, do you bring anything into the world? Do you bring anything into the world? No. Nothing. You were naked. Even your diaper, someone has to provide for you. <laughs> nothing. So when you die, actually you, you bring nothing out also. Yeah, nothing. So. If you are a very successful man, a, a businessman, even a president or, or you know a manager, we are the same. When we come face to face with God, when we come on the judgment day, all of us will have to humble ourselves and we need to seek the mercy of God. Because we brought nothing into the world and we will carry nothing out. How many of you, you know this Russian writer Tolstoy? If you do not know, he doesn't matter. But he told a very uh, interesting story about a man who always wants more, uh, never satisfied with things, never satisfied. Uh, he is a farmer. And so one day he had a chance, he had an opportunity, he had a chance. For 1,000 rupees, the offer was given to him. For 1,000 rupees, you can have all the land that you want, all the land that you walk on it. 1,000 rupees. You walk all the land you want, it's all yours. 1,000 rupees. Wow, what a good offer, isn't it? All the land that you walk on it, no matter how far you go, it's all yours. But there is one condition. Right? The condition is this. You must come back before sunset. Yeah, that was the only condition. Actually, we 
very easy. Very easy. You know, even in Hong Kong, you just walk like that. Huh? Wow, all this land is yours. You are very rich already, you know. <laughs> Especially in Hong Kong context. <laughs> Agree or not? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, the next morning, sunrise. Wow, okay. So, he started his first step and wow, very happy. Walk, 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 walk. Then he began to quicken his pace and he ran. And because of greed, he yes. ran even faster. Wow, all this is mine. And he began to run and run and run until noon. <laughs> he remembered, oh, I need to come back before sunset. So he began to run back. Remember, he has been running. Yeah. He has been running. So he needs to run back now. And he has been running and so he needs to run back and he is so tired and exhausted. So tired and exhausted. And so he saw the finishing line. And so with his last breath, he plunged himself. You know, he plunged himself into the finishing line just on time before sunset. And when he plunged himself, he died there. <laughs> At the finishing line. And his servant came with a spade and dig the ground and bury him there and there. The title of Tolstoy's story is How much land does, does a man need? How much land does a man need? <laughs> yeah. It's six feet from his head to his heels. That's all that he needed. Yeah. But the world is teaching us to be happy, we need more. To be happy, we need more. We need status. We need face. Yeah. But Bible says that godliness with contentment is great gain. Or perhaps some of you, you feel you are contented already. You are contented because, you know, my children have grown up. They have gone to college. I'm contented. Um, my business is doing well. My business is flourishing and I can, I can go to office on my own time. I'm contented. But this is contentment according to circumstances. It's not tied to godliness. So, I want to emphasize, God, it is Godliness with contentment is great gain. Not contentment of circumstances, which is only temporary. Our contentment must be tied to what is eternal. What is eternal. Now finally, I want to bring one example of a man who is really contented by pursuing just Jesus alone. And that is Paul himself. And in Philippians chapter 3, I think it's the next verse. Oh, I forgot to uh, say this. Um, Paul says this, uh, having food and clothing, having food and clothing, with this we shall be content. Having food and clothing, we shall be content. In fact, what we need is food and clothing. Food is our sustenance and clothing is our shelter. And uh, the wonderful thing is, God provided all this for us. Yes. Amen? God provided this for us in Matthew 6. I'm sure you're familiar with Matthew 6. Yeah? Matthew 6, after looking at the, the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, yeah. and God says, don't worry. Don't worry about what you eat or drink or what you wear. Yeah? Because God knows what you need. Yes. So what must you do in Matthew 6, 33? Yeah, seek first. Yeah, seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And then what? Can you continue? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So are you doing it? Yes. <laughs> Seek first. Seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then what you want, what you want, which God knows, will give it to you. Not just give it, but add it to you. What is that? Add it. That means God will bless in abundance, add it to you. That is a good father. Not just give peanuts, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But add it. Our God is a good God, good yeah. father. Yeah. When he wants to bless, it's always in abundance. Yeah. Amen or not? It's always, always in abundance. Yeah, we love 
this. We love this teaching. Blessings in abundance. God, I believe God will bless. Yes. But when God bless in abundance, do you still remember Jesus or not? Yes. <laughs> yes. Then good. Because the Israelites in the Old Testament, God blessed them in abundance, but they've forgotten about God. So the same with us. God wants to bless us in abundance, but will we still remember Him and be thankful and worship Him and be committed and be diligent? Seek first the kingdom of God, not the things of the world, but we, we, we've done the reverse. We go and seek first uh, career, seek first uh, university, college, uh, seek first our, our business, our job, seek first contract, uh, seek first girlfriend, boyfriend. <laughs> yeah? And all these things are important. God knows. But God says, you seek first the kingdom of God. <laughs> this one first. You seek one, this one first, then, then all these will follow. <laughs> yeah. Because Psalms 23 say the same thing. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow you. Yeah. That means you do not have to go and uh, chase after this, and then chase after this, and then go and, oh, you know, that's why we're so tired. <laughs> right now. Yeah, the prophet, the prophet go there, you go and chase after the prophet's reward. Uh, the, the, the prophet go there, uh, you, uh. No, according to Psalms 23, surely, you know, what is surely? Definitely. Definite, definite goodness and mercy shall follow you. You go and follow. Do you like this? Wow, only here, huh? Don't you like that? Here, is it very rich here? Yeah, here, no need, lah. Huh? I, I, I really believe this. When you seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will put in order. Amen. Yeah, because you have learned to do this first. Yes. Then, uh, when you are good in this, you will be good in prioritizing your things. Amen. I learned this. Yeah, you learn this one first. And when you are faithful in this, God will take care of this. In fact, God will give you wisdom on how to take care of this. In fact, that means to say, God has made our life easier. Amen. With this verse, this promise, seek first the kingdom of God. So, God has made our life easier, but we, we made it difficult. We did the reverse. When God has already provided for us, but we are not contented. I want more. <laughs> so finally, Paul. Paul, okay, the last one now. Paul, go to Paul in Philippians chapter 3. All the way to Paul, Philippians chapter 3. Ah, uh, someone. Okay, Paul's passion. And I want to end with this passion of Paul. And this has been my passion, still growing. And I want to share this passion with you. Paul says this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost everything. I consider them rubbish. <laughs> that I may gain Him and be found in Him. I want to know Him. I want to know Him and become like Him. Is that your passion? Amen. Amen. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness. Now this is in Philippians chapter 3. Again, you need to know the context. Before that, he, now you know Paul's background. He was a very religious teacher last time before he met Christ, right? Yeah, he was a very religious leader. So, in Philippians chapter 3, just a few verses before that, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day, a Pharisee of the Pharisee, a Hebrew of the Hebrew, and so forth, boasting about his, his past. Then, only he wrote this passage. Now, you know the story, Paul was a religious teacher, um, but the sad thing was, he didn't know Jesus personally. 
he knows the law. He was a religious person. But it was on the road to Damascus. In Acts, you know, the book of Acts, the light shined from heaven. The Bible says there was a light that came down from heaven and Paul fell down and he was blinded for three days. Right? He was blinded for three days. Then only after that, he knew. He, I mean, he knows about Jesus. I believe this personally. God wanted to blind him so that he see Jesus from the heart first. Yes. From the heart. Not just here. But from the heart. That day on the road to Damascus, he encountered the Lord Jesus. That transformed his life. Are you encountering Jesus? I'm using the present tense. Are you encountering Jesus every day? Not the past 20 years ago. Yeah, I received Jesus 20 years ago, but how about now? Are you still encountering Him? But Paul, that day when he encountered Jesus, his life changed. And, that, and, and because of that, he was able to say this. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing, surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Until he could say, I consider all this what? Rubbish. Wow. And I pray that this will be our passion. That, that you will say like what Paul said, I want to know Christ. I want to know Him and be found in Him. In fact, he says, I want to become like Him. To know Him is one thing. To become like Him is another thing. To know Him and become like Him. To know Him and become like Him. Until He's able to say, all these things are rubbish. But then again, after this service, you don't, you don't go back and tell your, your boss, huh? I don't want to work anymore, you're rubbish. <laughs> Please don't say that. You know, students, huh? on, when you go back to school, you don't, 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 don't throw off all your exercise books and say, all these are rubbish, I don't want to study anymore. No, that's not what Paul says. That's not what Paul means. Paul is saying that of all this I have gained, huh? well, all, all, all this is nothing compared to the glory of Jesus. Huh? The glory of Jesus is even greater. And this is what I want. Yeah, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things shall take care of itself. Yes. God will take care. I just seek first the kingdom of God. Wow. It's, it's the same like what David says. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Yes. Amen. And to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. One thing. One thing. We have many things in life. Yeah. Many things to do. Housework, groceries, send uh, children to school, and so forth. But, the Bible says, one thing. Make this the one thing. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord to seek first the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Tell your neighbor, one thing. One thing. <laughs> yeah, one thing. So, next week, when you come back, ask the person, have you done the one thing or not? One thing, one thing. Yeah, one thing. Wow, that one thing that we desire is to seek first the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. I want to end by repeating what I said just now. Remember this, our life, our soul was not created to find contentment in the things of the world. These are just like carrot that Satan used to dangle in front of us to distract us from the truth, from the kingdom of God. So now, let's turn our eyes to Jesus. Amen. Now I can remember the song that says that, turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full on His wonderful, thing, uh, wonderful face and the things of the world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Amen. You just turn your eyes upon Jesus and all these things will just grow strangely, strangely dim. And in the words of Paul, rubbish. That you just want to pursue Jesus and to love Jesus, that is the greatest commandment. To love Jesus with all your heart, 
Oh, you're so good. Oh, you're mine. 